Something that really annoys me is when someone tells me Bobby here is going to measure me and eat me one day. Or when they tell me that a snake chased them and they had to run for their life. If that's the kind of thing that annoys you too, stay tuned, because today we are going to expose the most ridiculous snake myths, and we're going to bust them so bad they never recover. Starting with number one, snakes chasing people. There he goes. The big guy. Ooh. Come on after me. He wins. <laughs> there you had a snake trying to get back to the shore and get back to somewhere it felt relatively safe. Kicking rocks at it was stupid, obviously. It wasn't chasing the rocks on the water either. It was ducking down just to get away from what it perceived as a potential threat or a predator. Water moccasins, I guess, are not as good as water snakes underneath the water, so they do like to stay on top. They will stand their ground a bit, but I was just trying to get back to shore. Now, there's two ways to take this myth. First is that some people are scared and so anytime they see a snake their imagination runs a bit wild and they can genuinely believe that it's chasing them purely out of fear in which case they'd run away completely the other way you can take this myth which really annoys me is that people use it as an excuse to harm the snake there we've seen the cotton mouse chasing me so i kick rocks at it next time it will be this garter snake was chasing me so i chopped it up with a shovel and we've seen this many, many, many times. We've heard lots of stories like this. Snakes do not chase people. Generally, you are simply in their way. Next up, the big one. Something we've all heard over the last year or so, I'm sure, is the idea of pythons measuring their owners to eat them later on. A woman had a pet snake that she loved very much. The snake was about seven feet long. And one day, it just stopped eating. After several weeks of trying everything, the lady still couldn't get the snake to eat. The woman took the snake to the vet and explained her situation. The vet replied, I see. Has your snake been sleeping with you at night or snuggling real close and stretching himself out? The woman said, Yes, every day and it makes me so sad that I can't help him feel better. The vet said to the lady, Ma'am, your snake is not sick. It has been preparing to eat you. He's been sizing you up every day so he knows how big he has to be. He's not eating, so he has enough room to digest you. Moral of the story, recognize the snakes around you. Just because they seem close to you doesn't mean their intentions aren't to devour you. That one was so stupid on so many levels, they couldn't even keep the story straight. First it was about snakes, and then they tried to infer that it was kind of like a little bit about human psychology as well. Um, it was terrible, all round. Can you imagine, basically, in the wild, if snakes did this, if snakes said to every prey item they came across, oh, excuse me, Mr. Bunny Rabbit or Mr. Gazelle, I've got to lie down and measure you before I try and eat you, they wouldn't ever eat. <laughs> they wouldn't ever survive or reproduce. From an evolutionary sense, that doesn't add up and it wouldn't work. Now, when it comes to eating humans, there's a big problem with humans for snakes, and that is the shoulders. Shoulders are very wide in proportion to our height or our length, and that means that we're always... Even if it's a big snake, like an anaconda or a reticulated python, we are always an awkward meal. And they don't tend to eat people for that fact. And because we're so dangerous, so volatile, um, which any animal knows. So overall, you know, it's a terrible idea. It doesn't make any sense. Finally, to add to this, there's also the fact that we don't smell like their regular food. We smell like a human. A lot of these snakes are used to eating like rabbits, large birds, even small gazelles, etc. They will eat large prey, they'll even eat crocodiles, for example. But human isn't in their typical list of prey items. And a lot of them, you find, they kind of stick to a select few things. Next up, a really, really popular one, and that is that all venomous snakes have triangular heads. How do you know if a snake is venomous or not? Typically, venomous snakes have triangular-shaped heads, pupils with slits like a cat's, and thick bodies. Some venomous snakes are also classified as pit vipers, such as rattlesnakes and copperheads. These types of snakes have pits just behind their noses that they use to detect prey. If you like this video, 
follow and subscribe. Okay, the reason this myth is terrible is because it is partly rooted in, in fact, loosely. In North America, for example, and a lot of regions of South America, the main types of venomous snakes are viprids, like cottonmouths, um, copperheads, and rattlesnakes, for example, or even the fur de lance. And they do have triangular heads, and most of them have slit pupils, too. Um, so that is kind of the basis for it. But you've also got lots of families of snakes and lots of different types of snakes. So you've got coral snakes, even as far north as South Carolina, perhaps even North Carolina, I'm not sure on that one. But you've got coral snakes throughout the Americas and around the world. You've got other coral snakes and other relatives of coral snakes like cobras, which are in the Elapidae family. And they have a lot more of a kind of a slim profile, much, much like a, you know, a milk snake or something else. And they are much harder to recognize by head shape or other features so just going off head shape is a very dangerous way of doing things and it is likely to get you in trouble now what adds even more confusion to this is that a lot of snakes that are harmless use what we call batesian mimicry and that is where they make themselves look like a venomous species either through their appearance or their behaviors but mostly through their appearance so in Papua New Guinea, for example, you have viper boas, which have a very triangular head, and they've got kind of a viperish pattern down their back, but they really are pretty good at looking like a viper, but they're harmless. So all in all, it's very confusing. Your best bet is to never touch a snake that you haven't positively identified first. Next up, and this is a fun one, milk snakes drink milk from cows. Ever wonder why milk snakes are called milk snakes? In Central America, when farmers would find these guys in their barns, they would mistakenly believe that the snakes were in there to drink the milk from their cows. Now, this is something that snakes don't do, and in fact, they can't digest milk. The reason why the snakes were in the barns was because they were looking for rats. The name just happened to stick. Milk snakes do not possess lactase. Lactase is the enzyme that humans, for example, most humans, um, possess and use to digest milk. So dairy or milk or any kind is never going to be an acceptable food for a snake. And this myth is just terrible. But <laughs> to make it even more terrible is the fact that milk snakes have teeth. They don't have really big teeth, but they can scratch you. They can make you bleed a little bit if they bite you. So they've got four rows of teeth up top. They've got two rows of teeth down bottom. And I find it very, very hard to believe that a cow would sit there and let a snake stick all its teeth in its teeth and, and drink from it. I just don't think that's a, you know, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> what is true from this myth is that milk snakes do love barns. Barns are great places for snakes to hunt because they attract rodents. There's also great places to hide like hay bales, which actually stay a bit warmer at night as well. And often, even on the inside of the barn and around the sides, there's tin piles or wood piles. So that part of the myth that they frequent barns is true. The part about drinking milk from snakes, very untrue. Next up is a bit of a peculiar one. It's the idea that all snakes lay eggs. I really don't know how this started, but I do know that most of them do lay eggs. The temperature and humidity are just right for her eggs to develop. This is a false coral snake, which is protected by its appearance. Few animals would dare to attack it. Five weeks have gone by since she mated, and she's found a good hiding place to lay her eggs, a hole under a tree trunk. The temperature and humidity are just right for her eggs to develop. Although some snakes, like the big pythons, brood their eggs, the normal thing is for snakes to abandon their offspring as soon as they've laid their eggs. Their maternal instinct goes no farther than looking for a safe place to hatch. Independence is the rule that governs the serpent family. Independence between mothers and children, and between males and females. They don't form couples, there is no collaboration. They have no relationship beyond copulation, and they don't even have to see each other every mating season. 
Some snakes have a superpower that enables them to store the male sperm for years while they wait for the right environmental conditions to fertilize their eggs. That was an interesting little clip there just to go into detail about how some snakes lay their eggs and a bit about their reproduction, so that was interesting. What I would say is that most snakes, I'm going to say somewhere between 70 and 80% of snakes do lay eggs, and I guess that's probably where the myth came from. But there's a significant proportion of snakes that bear live young, so rattlesnakes for example, anacondas and sea snakes, and it has different kinds of advantages. For a sea snake it's pretty easy to understand why it's advantageous um, because you know laying eggs underwater isn't great. Eggs need oxygen exchange so they just die so that really makes sense. But what I like to do with myths like this to debunk them properly is give a practical example of how an egg laying species does compared to how a live bearing species does. And you can do that in Europe with the adder, which is our only venomous snake here in Britain, and also happens to be the snake that goes, the only snake, I would say, that enters the Arctic Circle. It's the northernmost snake species in the world. And we also have the grass snake. The grass snake uh, gets quite far up, maybe halfway up Sweden in distribution, but it doesn't enter the Arctic Circle. It doesn't get quite as far north as the adder. And the reason for this is pretty simple. Grass snakes lay eggs. Female grass snakes in colder environments, they have to travel until they find a good nesting site for their eggs. And often they use compost heaps and sometimes they travel quite far. And this is a challenge for them. They can't just have their eggs laid anywhere because it won't get warm enough. It's only decomposing vegetation that gets their eggs warm enough to hatch. The adder, on the other hand, bears live young, so it can bask. They're so good at finding good basking spots, in fact, that they've even been seen basking when there's snow on the ground. And this has allowed the adders to keep their young on the inside, keep them warm as long as they need to until birth, and have this risk factor gone, as it were, in terms of, you know, all your eggs being laid and then just dying of cold. And that's allowed them to go further north. So that's a practical example of why live bearing is better in some circumstances and some environments. Next up is a really old one. The idea that you can tell a rattlesnake's age from its rattle. There's an old myth that you can count the number of rattles and therefore say how old a rattlesnake is. But the bottom line is this is not true. Rattlesnakes gain a section of rattle every time they shed their skin and they do that three to five times a year. So therefore, you can't count their rattles to know how old they are. That's 100% correct. They gain a new segment of the rattle. It's like it bolts on every time they shed and stays behind and adds another link, another segment. And they shed at least three times a year, maybe more, it depends on their age, growth rate, etc. For example, when they come out of hibernation, one of the first things they often do is shed. Um, and young ones will shed more rapidly. And what makes this even worse of a kind of a way of telling their age is the fact that those older segments, they do get broken up and they get a bit brittle and they fall off. So the rattlesnake, an adult one, is gaining segments every few months and it's losing segments as well. So you can never really tell how old they are. But baby rattlesnakes, when they're first born, and up until I think their second shed, only have one little piece of a rattle. They have what you call a button, so they don't have a proper rattle. And that is a way that you can identify a baby rattlesnake, you know, along with the fact that it's like under a foot long where the adults are three times the size. So there's, again, like with many of these, there's a tiny kernel of truth, but it is still debunked nonetheless. Last but not least, <laughs> not least by a long shot, is an absolute doozy. The idea that snakes hypnotize their prey. How a boa hypnotizes its prey. So this we're talking about the boa boas that they have something in their brain that yeah. telepathically yeah. brings other animals to them. Yeah, normally they don't move. Sometimes for six years, ten years, uh, sometimes in swampy areas like this, uh, we see a big open area. See, but we always have been walking for through here for ten years, and after ten years. That's when you know a boa is near. I mean, that was just perhaps the stupidest one out of the bunch. I love the way the guy telling the story looked kind of like he was making it up as he was going along. I think he wanted to laugh. I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I'm pretty sure he knew it was 
a load of crap as well. <laughs> it's quite funny. Often what you find is that prey animals will freeze in the presence of a predator. When you're face to face with a, a python and you're a bunny rabbit, that's kind of like your last line of defense if you think you've got nowhere to go. And they will freeze and it does look kind of like they're hypnotized. But no, snakes do not have telepathic abilities, unless my snakes didn't tell me. Um, and they don't have any power to hypnotize their prey. One thing that cobras can do, I guess, which looks kind of like hypnotic is the way they, you know, people think they dance, but they, they sway back and forth and they rear up and all this stuff. And I, I, that kind of gives us an understanding where this kind of thing can come from. Um, but that is actually defensive behavior. It's trying to make themselves look bigger. They're trying to follow your hand or whatever's moving in front of them. It's not hypnosis. So this one, again, is thoroughly debunked. Anyway, that's going to do it for today. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I hope that you feel like we have debunked these myths enough. If anyone says anything completely silly, like snakes measuring people to eat them, don't bother arguing, just share this video with them instead. <laughs> um, but thank you for watching, as always, please do like and subscribe, and I'll see you again soon.